సౌండ్ ఓకే కొంచెం సౌండ్ తగ్గించుకోవాలా గుడ్ ఆఫ్టర్నూన్ ఫ్రెండ్స్ అట్ అనద ఇయర్ అట్ అనద మెయిన్ ఎగ్జామ్ ఆఫ్ ఆంథ్రోపాలజీ ఫర్ యూపీఎస్సి అండ్ ఐ అబ్జల్యూట్లీ కంగ్రాచులేట్ దోస్ స్టూడెంట్స్ హూ హ్యావ్ అటెంప్టెడ్ ద టెస్ట్ ఇన్ ద మార్నింగ్ అండ్ యూ మస్ట్ బీ బిజీ టేకింగ్ ద సెకండ్ టెస్ట్ so as such uh, based on the plan uh, right now we are uh, going to talk about paper 1 a bit of analysis of how questions were asked etc so that uh, the students who are going to prepare for the next year you'll have uh, <coughs> sound the you'll have uh, a much better idea to how what kind of areas to be focused at henceforth kind of and uh, as uh, i generally make it a point to our students that uh, every year examiner tries to uh, pick up a couple of questions that might be a surprise uh, for the student and uh, just because two or three such questions are there which you might have not heard much about or you might not have heard it or heard about it at all that doesn't uh, that that should not lead to a particular kind of an opinion or prejudice against the subject yeah i mean such kind of questions actually make you much more cautious um, in uh, making your preparation everything said and done what is once again established in this paper is your absolute command over the facts and the way you are able to bring uh the concepts the command over the concepts and how the concepts you are able to incorporate in application based questions so uh only that person who is having this combination one of conceptual clarity to the ability of translating those concepts to applications this is the kind of a person who would be really doing good and such kind of experimentation is uh, more or less being done in almost all the uh, in almost all the subjects i mean the way when we are looking at the other uh, optional subjects as well <coughs> okay namma no, even no problem here so those couple of questions uh, that uh, uh, i would want to bring to your notice because uh, our students kept calling and uh, were talking about uh two or three questions of that kind one absolute new term people uh, uh got was glotto chronology that is one and uh, one other question that is this was uh, um, a part of the digital anthropology related content that is 7a you can see um, methods of qualitative data analysis so people who might have been working in the software sector uh, you might be feeling more than happy about it and uh, maybe more than jubilant about it so i think uh, you might have been the people who seem to have answered that question and the third question which was relatively a surprise but otherwise looking at uh, various journals that were actually published in this year's uh, you know the first half of the year um mm, uh, arjun apadure's contributions because he comes from an american indian origin and uh, kind of contributions i don't i don't look at it as a surprise because quite a number of articles were published uh, on him so that was something that was a you know more or less expected thing not really a surprise so basically all together if you look at uh, the surprise element in the exam maybe 5c and uh, 7a now to begin with uh, <coughs> let me give you this help regarding uh, what are the other kinds of uh, uh, teasing things that upsc had done with the students about this also we had been telling many times uh, before in your regular classes also i was mentioning that is uh, if at all you are going with this uh, understanding that let me revise india related things or uh, paper to related things in the break and um, i mean that that will not do because there is a possibility that quite a lot of things from paper 2 might come in paper 1 and vice versa so it is from that point of view if we observe um, there are questions like you know uh, 2b is there 
a question related to Paleolithic environment with special reference to India. <coughs> and uh, India related uh, other questions. Uh, 4C, major Mesolithic sites and typo technological features with special reference to India. So, Mesolithic cultures of India, this is the second one. Third question, which actually uh, is generally studied for paper 2, that is uh, prehistoric significance of Rakhigari. Rakhigari, which was you know, more or less there everywhere in the discussions of anthropology this year. Uh, three questions and uh, yeah, of course, Arjun Anadurai technically should come in paper 2, but uh, because of the content. So, we see that about, uh, yeah. Uh, one more we have is 4A, the role of marriage regulations in traditional societies in India and in strengthening social solidarity. So, basically here marriage regulations are with Indian examples you should be. As you could see five questions are there which uh, have that technical belongingness to paper 2 have been asked in paper 1. So, this way one should also be prepared and let me also look at this. Though it is uh, not very clearly uh, uh, you know, written as uh, Indian anthropology related question, but generally we study it in Indian anthropology. That is 1D customary laws and uh, environmental conservation. So, that is generally we study as a part of political systems of the northeastern region and uh, that is also being asked in paper 1. So, about uh, 5 to 6 questions of paper 2, we see that they made their place in paper 1. So, <coughs> that is the thing. Once again, to sum up, before I <coughs> sorry, before I go to discuss each one of the questions, um, one uh, major thing which is repeated in this year's exam as well, is somebody having an absolute command over the concepts and the ability to apply to the requirement, those are the ones that seem to be doing really good and that is how UPSC is optional subjects, whatever may be the optional subject have been taking the students towards. So, on that note, uh, let me take you to individual questions. The idea here is we will be giving you the major structures of the questions. <coughs> uh, scope and relevance of uh, social and uh, cultural anthropology, a 10 marker out there. So, basically, social and cultural anthropology. I would want you to begin with the discussion about the nomenclature, wherein socio-cultural anthropology is a special terminology associated with Indian anthropology. On the other hand, elsewhere in the world, we see terminologies such as social anthropology and cultural anthropology distinctively. So, this discussion should form part of your first paragraph and the prominent thinker that you may perhaps incorporate is Paul Bohannon. With that, you may begin your answer. And then, uh, basically, there are two terms that are given in your uh, question. One is the scope and second one is relevance. This is one of the very simple kind of a question and also, you may perhaps incorporate discussion related to the old name of sociocultural anthropology, that is ethnology. So, this perhaps uh, the nomenclature related discussion you may perhaps give between 40 to 50 words. Then you have uh, uh, the scope of it, 
when we talk about scope, you may perhaps uh, give a flow chart related to that, incorporating various contents that may be familial systems, familial studies, political anthropological studies, economic anthropological studies, you have things like religion, study of language, etc. All these are being studied with the help of specific methodologies and most importantly studied from integrationalist uh, approach, culture pattern approach and culture core model. This talks about your scope. Coming to relevance, when we talk about relevance, so I made it a point that your opening statement can be based on nomenclature. So I have not given things on relevance out there. When we talk about relevance, this is contemporary applications, so applied sociocultural anthropology. When we say applied sociocultural anthropology, that may be related to development planning, it may be cultural studies required in trade or maybe perhaps in things like defense, international relations, bringing new legal systems and also dealing with specific issues such as displacement, rehabilitation and not to forget in the contemporary times, things like uh, UCC, rights movements such as, so that forms part of your applications. <coughs> I repeat what I have written on the board, three major segments. Uh, I am not trying to uh, sort of bring them together or you know integrate them. I am only trying to divide the thing into three specific areas. This may not be the case with most of the questions, but in this particular case you spend good amount of time on emergence of the nomenclature. Scope, it is more or less writing the entire syllabus, but then you will have to add various methodologies and approaches to study. And then you have applied the sociocultural anthropology with more contemporary kind of a relevance that may be planning, economic systems and trade, displacement, etc., etc. That is one. I will be going a little quicker so that uh, cultural impact of uh, Iron Age. This is something which was written extensively. by the contemporary anthropologist Rakesh Tiwari. He was trying to look at how technological determinism was affecting resource utilization and environmental exploitation, how technology was deciding economic subsistence political power, these are the ones that you are going to 
elaborate on habitational sites human migration when i say habitational sites that may be emergence of more urban centers economically intensified agriculture specialization in terms of artisanhood weaponry and that weaponry is connected to political power weapons wars long distance ship building etc habitational sites urbanization and also we see more permanent agricultural settlements emerging economically again we see new measurement systems new unification systems and that is where he speaks about a combination of more advanced forms of writings and metal cultures emerging so basically entire system of socio cultural milieu changing you may perhaps conclude by saying that uh, how child had described neolithic as a revolution first revolutionary age in culture iron age can be seen as a neo revolution with more long term impact so basically your discussion the whole thing revolves around rakesh tiwari's uh, explanations on cultural impact of iron age i read out what i have written you are beginning with his name itself technological determinism <coughs> we i mean right now here i am not giving you uh, basic timelines and all but in the examination situation if one could remember that you know Uh, the emergence of iron age or iron smelting at a specific uh, you know a timeline that may be incorporated as a basic fact sheet so in india uh, and uh, in west asia in north america what are the evidences of iron smelting that can be given as a small indication there that that shows who was there you know uh, spearheading the whole thing so economically i was talking about new measurement methods then uh, specialization artisanship weaponry agricultural intensive uh, you know intensive agriculture etc politically because of weapons wars became much more prominent and uh, um, there was specialization of uh, of soldiers emerging and then long distance wars also long distance trades also unification with the form of writings habitational sites got diversified both agricultural and uh, urban settlements they got changed and of course much more liberal migration mechanisms and hence for tiwari it is a neo revolutionary time with all inclusive long term change one can experience that is one <coughs> then we are going to the third question out there some very 
uh, obvious kind of questions we may not be discussing in detail. Nevertheless, where there is a possibility and requirement of giving perspectives, I will be. Race and ethnicity. This is a topic wherein prominently the thinkers such as D. N. Majumdar, Boas, and Raymond Firth. Frederick Barth, they can be in even if you do not remember anybody else, Frederick Barth is mandatory when we talk about race and ethnicity. There can be several ethnic boundaries or basis of ethnicity, one of them could be race. <coughs> so, basically Barth was trying to narrate how race can be a powerful mechanism of bringing that togetherness under the title called ethnicity. That is the whole argument. So, you may perhaps begin with uh, Barth's idea of race and uh, ethnicity, this could be one way of beginning. And uh, it is also advised suppose you do not remember Barth's name is like this is a concept wherein the biological aspect of race seem to be having a close connect with sociological sociological solidarity or bringing together the V-ness under ethnicity. So, basically ethnicity we see as a combination of sociological and various things, but then race is generally seen as biological. This can actually be redefined, the question can be redefined as race and racism that is how you should be driving home the idea of bringing together <coughs> so your discussion has to be race which is right now more or less a theoretical biological construct has emerged as a powerful mechanism of social stratification that is where you bring about ideas of Boas that is non-existence of pure races, but prevalence of the applications. And what you should be incorporating is why this particular topic is relevant right now and all the views of Boas which he had given are still relevant in today's times. 
contemporary relevance. And the other thing you should be incorporating is how the discipline of anthropology can come up with suggestions and mechanisms to alleviate the dangers of racism. I repeat what I have mentioned there. We are actually talking about race and ethnicity, which can be modified as a discussion of race and racism. And that is where we are using the concept of bars that is ethnic boundaries. Race is one of the ethnic boundaries that is creating social stratification of racism. So this is more an analytical kind of a thing. You are trying to give opinions of people. And you are trying to bring home a point whether it is the concept is relevant in today's times in understanding racism in, that is prevailing. So basically, huge lot of studies we come across like apartheid studies of Africa or you know, when we talk about caste and race in India. It all depends on how you are able to bring in those snippets in your discussions. But ultimately, we want you to come with anthropology's suggestions to deal with this kind of a problem of race and ethnicity. Then we have uh, the other question, namely customary laws and environmental conservation. Basically, this is a combination of uh, belief system and uh, <coughs> socio-political laws. In other words, a combination of a spirit and uh, man that were brought together by the fact of nature, how nature is treated by social systems due to the belief system. So basically, directly or indirectly, we are talking about nature man spirit complex, which actually guides uh, the tribal customary laws. And in the specific context here, if at all we say customary law, only customary law is given in the exam, you will write about various, you know, uh, um, various uh, 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 crimes or various kinds of uh, behavioral anomalies or violation of rules that might have led to particular ways in which punishments are given. And also, some of you who have heard this from me, customary laws, we generally talk about it in the special context of northeastern regions of India, tribal customary law in the northeast. And hence, you, know, you can perhaps take the examples from the northeastern region alone, or maybe perhaps when you are generalizing how you will have to do. So basically, what you may perhaps do is, apart from beginning with that, you may uh, also say, that uh, customary law takes into account various things that is violation of uh, violation of rules related to mate selection or marriage adultery it may be violation of economic rules violation of rules related to nature, violation of clan-based rules, naturism, you might say. So when I'm talking about all this incest, uh, marriage and divorce, economy, clan, and all, all these form part of customary laws, wherein the, each, each culture group comes up with its own specific rules to be followed and punishments to be given. Now, out of all these, when we are talking about environmental conservation, we are coming to two major things. One is 
naturism, second one is existence of clan system. So, how environmental conservation goes hand in hand with the customary laws among the tribals. So, it is actually a topic that brings together totemism, clan identity and environmental conservation. So, basically the traditional sustainable ways of living the traditional sustainable ways of living with the interconnection between man and nature. I hope the question is clear. Your scope of answer is clan and naturism. So, you can give good number of examples here. The examples may be totemistic practices. So, you can take a few from central India. You need not have to worry much because whatever information that you have learnt in your regular session. So, once again let me say this to you that uh, uh, this, this actually shows how one can recall the entire information that you have learnt, you have studied throughout your course. So, at that point of time those examples or understanding should should you know uh, uh, come in, in the right moment. So, popular examples that you have are the Gond practices, Bill practices and then when you go to the northeastern region the concepts such as sacred grooves given by Dr. D. N. Majumdar. So, basically and then uh, you have the totemistic explanations given by Darkheim, how the clan and sub clan is there, uh, how totemism ensures mutual protection of flora and fauna. And how all these regulations in a way determine economic exploitation. And not to forget currently all these customary laws especially related to environmental conservation have come under the purview of forest laws. So, your answer has to bring in in the last paragraph what is the controversy between the tribal customary law and forest laws. And this is one of the reasons for tribal resistances against the modern laws. I hope that is clear. take back once again to you there. <coughs> so, you can have a relook at the structure. We were talking about a combination of belief system and social or political laws. How NMS complex can be used to explain this particular phenomena and you also very clearly make a indication there. Uh, that customary law is generally studied in the context of India in the northeastern tribes and how punishments are given for violation of specific crimes. Customary law prevails across different kinds of crimes, but here environmental conservation that comes closer to naturism and clan system and various other sub components of culture that come close to this is one is totemism, then uh, sustainable living between, by, between man and nature and the institution of a clan. Over and above that, uh, it becomes necessary for you to give examples from different parts of the world. In India, we have uh, enough number of case studies that were given by different thinkers. 
Majumdar was talking about the sacred forests or sacred groves, central Indian tribes that have been using totemism as a mechanism of not consuming their own totemic uh, uh, origin individuals. And then there came, of course, uh, has to be written because without him totemism and protectionism of environment cannot be explained. And uh, your later part of the answer has to give the controversy between modern forest laws and the customary laws and what is the major problem related to them. We have another question coming up, that is gene expression. Um, <clears throat> it is here that we will have to bring in the terms such as epigenetics and anthropology or anthropogenetics. In anthropology, epigenetics is generally used in order to study the various aspects of gene expression and the mechanisms that are involved in changing the genetic characteristics. With that, maybe perhaps you can begin uh, your answer. biological anthropologists and geneticists such as Weddington can be used. So, he was the person who was trying to talk about the combination of epigenetics and anthropogenetics. <coughs> when I am saying that uh, uh, our focus should be on what are the mechanisms that are used in changing genetic characteristics. In fact, uh, with the similar kind of a content, another question was also asked. Maybe we will go to that later, but uh, yeah, in uh, question number 8b also, there is something mentioned. Describe the causes of structural abnormalities of chromosomes with suitable examples. So, more or less the structural abnormalities you would be trying to explain here. So, enlisting them and trying to give single liners on them, such as translocation duplication things like deletion inversion. So, because this is a shorter question, you may not be able to you know give the entire uh, explanation here. So, basically you are trying to enlist the causes and then how these causes may result in you know different types of expressions. So, basically they may be X linked expressions or autosomal, chromosomal abnormality. So, what I suggest is you may perhaps use a table, each of the categories you might give, uh, like translocation, you may mention Philadelphia chromosome or inversion, deletion, etcetera like when we talk about deletion, Kraidu-Chart syndrome kind of. So, you can perhaps give a table and what is the major process that is going on there. Because when you are giving a table, you will have an opportunity to study a bit more on applications of epigenetics in the contemporary times. Why exactly gene expression is being studied in anthropology in contemporary times. So, if at all you are not 
giving in, in, in a crisp table, you would end up writing the details about it and what is more contemporarily relevant that may not come to your answer. So, I think it is better, I once again take you back. We are trying to incorporate uh, epigenetics versus anthropogenetics, which is actually the field which focuses more on gene expression, because gene expression uh, is uh, an explanation about how, what are the mechanisms that are bringing change in the genetic characteristics. And that is where in uh, anthropology, it becomes much important to see what are the kinds of chromosomal aberrations emerging. In the brief fact table, you can incorporate that and you may talk about contemporary requirements or contemporary issues that are associated with the study of epigenetics. So, maybe in order to see the inheritance of a certain you know chromosomal aberrations or certain disease conditions uh, to be to be you know uh, done away with or maybe perhaps you may incorporate the ideas of uh, producing more positively disposed populations through eugenic mechanisms. So, you may perhaps bring those uh, you know discussions here so that you have this chance of uh, and then coming to the other questions here. You have the other one discuss the major species of Australopithecus discovered from southern and east Africa. <coughs> Discover the dis describe the discovery, physical features, significance of tongue fossil. So, basically the two parts are there. You may perhaps see to it that um, uh, this can be like you know 5 to 7 and half marks for the first part and then rest of it for the second part, because second part calls for describing and uh, giving the whole lot of things about the tongue fossil. Um, so, that is how. So, in uh, the list of uh, important areas uh, that was released just before your exam, uh, so the questions that we were mentioning in the first question, first four questions were given and then uh, Australo was given, Paleolithic environment was given. Nutritional, disorder, nutritional anthropology I had given a modified question you can see in 2 C that is different forms of malnutrition and describe the various protein, calorie, malnutrition, etcetera with examples. So, I had uh, used the term that is nutritional anthropology. So, let me also show certain other things. Uh, when it comes to 3 A we have uh, given a question such as combination of biological and cultural. Uh, evolution in Homo sapiens. So, that uh, uh, instead of uh, distinguishing biological and cultural uh, evolution, he has used the common word that is hominization process. We will talk about it. Geats was always there, you know, last couple of years we had been looking for his questions and uh, this time much more elaborate question on his religion had come. And uh, human growth studies, as I always tell the students that you are not supposed to neglect chapter 10, 11 and 12 human growth related questions obviously are going to come. So, that is also said. Marriage regulations for a short question I had given, here you see it for a long question with an application. And personal identification I had given for a bigger question of 20 marks, here he is giving for 15 marks. Mesolithic typo technologies and microliths was also a question that you were supposed to prepare. Polygenic inheritance by default you were studying. Rakhigari was also given. Menarche, menopause. Instead of simply saying symptoms, we have mentioned as cultural studies related to menarche and menopause. Cultural lag we did not talk about. So, I mean in the class we spoke, but then in the important areas list I did not give. And uh, Mm, then fieldwork traditions we had spoken about of uh, I mean in the in the expected list fieldwork traditions evolution specifically uh, mead I did not speak about globalization indigenous populations was there practical applications of DNA technologies with the same title was given <coughs> seven a was a real experiment we had uh, spoken about it as digital anthropology now this is 
uh, a little more detailed and truly an expected question for me. And uh, yeah, 7 b is a question related to Hardy Weinberg's law. Uh, instead of using the term Hardy Weinberg's law, he was asking about um, what are the assumptions related to genetic equilibrium. So, in your test program, you had answered this particular thing. Then, uh, national character studies was also done with the contemporary relevance. Uh, he is actually trying to you know tease the student by giving the terms such as political and methodological aspects. In fact, the background of national character studies is political and methodological aspects only or we can say that political and cultural aspects. But in order to somehow tease the student that uh, redundant terminology is actually used. And uh, yeah, Apadurai must have come as a surprise for the student. Causes of structural abnormalities, this was also given. Krober's contributions or kinship studies in anthropology specifically was given. So, if at all student was finding it difficult to make a choice in the questions, uh, and uh, in the in making a choice in the questions. The combination of uh, social and cultural anthropology was obviously there. So, you cannot say that uh, he should be asking uh, biological anthropology in paper in, in section 2 and social anthropology in section 1. This kind of a distinction he had left long time back. So, suppose you are choosing questions, let us see. If somebody is uh, really good in archaeology, you would be doing question number 2. So, archaeology in a combination of India and the world. So, fossil evidences, Indian archaeology and then you have nutritional anthropology. So, this can be a question that can be easily attempted. And the second thing is, so compulsory questions if you are observing. Uh, if at all you are uh, uh, question number 4, if you see, uh, if one is comfortable with marriage regulations, personal identification like forensic studies, dentition, skeletal studies, etcetera, I mean that is pretty direct kind of a question and a mesolithic uh, fossil evidence, mesolithic evidence of India. So, you can actually see that uh, in, pay, in section 1, all three questions with the combination of cultural and archaeological things. So, you can see one question coming from archaeology, one question coming from you know, social anthropology, one coming from biological anthropology. So, you cannot say that I will learn one and leave the other, but all the three are comfortable questions to pick up from. So, in this particular paper, student can actually pick up extra question from paper from section 1 in a comfortable way. Because when we are coming to section 2, in section 2, what can be a common choice of the student? That can be question number 6. So, thought related question is there, economic anthropology. So, basically social anthropology question and a very direct question on DNA technologies. So, 6 is a very safe question to take from, <coughs> because you might find it difficult with 7a even if 7c you are able to write very nicely, 7a could be a major stumbling block and unless otherwise somebody had done an apadurai, you may not be able to touch question number 8a and hence you know in your section 2, 6 is a sure short question which will give you comfortable marks. So, if you are going into the details and looking at the paper, this is a paper that is easily doable. So, unless you know we see uh, compulsory questions, in the compulsory questions a uh, major problem that you might have encountered is only 5 c. So, one such surprise would naturally be there. So, if somebody is preparing the content based on uh, whatever basic rules are there, only one question that would be uncomfortable for you that will be 5 c. Other than that, uh, you know, most of the things that you have done from your class, from the important areas list, you would be able to take care. So, if at all somebody is trying to point out, I, I know pretty sure that student would point out uh, 8a and 5c uh, or maybe 7a to say that c questions are very highly unexpected and all blah, blah, blah kind of a thing that will naturally happen you will have to see the other side of it, where exactly the comfort is there with the 
uh, with the with the on the paper. So <coughs> you are going in a right way, not to worry about it. So let me come back on this two A. So last year actually we had done both paper one and two on the same day. Uh, I remember last year we were discussing the second paper up to I think 9:30 or 10 in the night. But today I thought I would be doing paper one alone, and then tomorrow morning we will be doing uh, paper two. And if the live is possible, we will try to share the live link also in the morning. Let's see how. Yeah. Let me come to the other question. Major species of Australopithecus discovered from South and uh, East Africa. Sir, if you remember, uh, in your class, we had spoken about somebody called Butiner Jonas, who had given regional variants of Australo, categorizing them into South African and East African Australo. So the requirement here is that particular table with sites has to come. This is one kind of a categorization. Janusz himself was also giving the categorization based on size, body size. But then this itself would incorporate the body size based categorization also. So this solves the question of uh, the first part. After having given the table or in the introduction itself you may talk about the basic comparison of a South African Australo and uh, East African Australo. Whatever uh, basic arguments you have come across in terms of whether uh, South Africa is a, is a you know, gracile uh, Australo land and East Africa was a, um, robust Australo land kind of controversies. So chronologically we saw that kind of a division and later you would be making a mention that in the later times we found both gracile and robust astrolo in both the regions and that is where uh, butaner Janusz tabulation of all those species would come into picture. So a word about his and appreciation would do. And then the second part we are talking about is uh, a tongue fossil which is seen as a signature uh, uh, or, or uh, uh, the signature species of southern Africa and we also call it Australopithecus africanus. Mm. And uh, that is where you talk about the discovery in the sense that which site, what are the, <coughs> so with the town fossil, the town fossil, what was the fossil material? who discovered and uh, listing of the physical features. So you are already trained in that physical features like what are the cranial features, what are the post cranial features. And then when we talk about importance, importance in identifying the major missing link and importance in terms of the immediate, immediate human ancestors. And also the debate related to felt down versus tongue. These things have to become part of your answer. Discovery, physical features and significance. Significance because that is the one that laid 
very clearly the possibility of having Australo as one of the ancestral species of Homo sapiens. Uh, but then you see uh, with that orientation it had begun. In the last paragraph you will have to talk about uh, Tong fossil right now being placed on a separate line of evolution away from Homo sapiens. Uh, right now we see that Anamensis was our uh, no, immediate Australo ancestor. So, you may perhaps give a small picture there showing the phylogeny of uh, the Tong fossil vis-a-vis -vis Homo sapiens. Try to make it you know a very uh, comfortable one based on uh, the size of the question because if it is 20 marker you would have enough of scope to draw a picture of uh, you know, phylogeny that becomes an essential one. So, those of you who must have spent your midnight soil on learning archaeology, you must have seen the kind of variety of questions uh, that have come. So, let me once again look at the number of questions or the marks that are awarded for archaeology. So, if we are moving from first question, in the first question you have cultural impact of iron age that is archaeology question. In question number 2, you have two questions that is 35 marks, 35 and then there are 10, 45 marks. And uh, in question number 3, hominization process that is you know, a combination of you know, archaeology and fossils. So, we see here this is coming for 20, 65 marks so far from archaeology and fossils, 65. And then uh, in uh, question number 4, 4 C is from archaeology. So, that makes it 80 marks and 5 B is uh, there. Uh, so, how many is it? Uh, 60 and uh, this becomes uh, 70, no, I missed out somewhere. We started with 10, 35, 45. 6, 45, 65, 65, this was 80 and uh, yeah, 5 B becomes 90, then uh, 90 marks, 90 marks, yeah, 90 marks from your archaeology out of 250 marks. <coughs> that is quite a good thing. Now, let me take you to the other questions. <coughs> we are here about uh, Paleolithic environment in the light of available resources, evidences with special reference to India. The question Paleolithic environment in the light of available resources. <coughs> Basically, the question is talking about um, whether we are able to categorize Indian archaeology, Indian Paleolithic culture on the lines of global Paleolithic culture. And secondly, we will have to you know get clues regarding what kind of environment was existing in the lower, middle and upper Paleolithic ages. Uh, and then you have, uh, you know, in each of those cultural ages, you have specific site references that actually show what kind of climatic conditions were suiting what kind of habitational sites and then perhaps what kind of floral and faunal existence were there based on which economic subsistence of man of the time, habitational sites of man of the time was actually changing. So, basically, uh, no, I would uh, try to share this particular write-up with you, which uh, is actually made uh, in a way that you do not miss out on what are the you know, climatic conditions that made man of the time you know, choose particular kinds of tools, etcetera. So, that you may perhaps get soon after the discussion. We will be adding this in your uh, description link that is 2b, which you can get. You have the other one that is different forms of malnutrition and uh, describe protein and calorific uh, malnutrition among the people. This we will 
have a look at. Basically, this is a topic of discussion number one in uh, nutritional anthropology. Second thing is, this has also become an area of discussion, especially in the context of uh, emergence of monoculture uh, um, in, the, in the globalizing phenomena. And that is where uh, the relevance comes into picture. So, let me bring to you here. As a part of nutritional anthropology, the anthropologists were trying to look at two major things. One is development disorders, which are elitistic. Second one is development disorders affecting development disorders affecting the poor and the disadvantaged but both of them put together under malnutrition based conditions and this kind of a categorization, you may perhaps use the reference of Debar Commission that talked about Indian tribal health. But then we also have certain global examples, study of monoculture, trade spreading undesirable food habits giving rise to prevalence of non-communicable diseases among distant, isolated, tribal and other communities. This may form the beginning of your answer and then perhaps you may talk about different forms that is vitamin deficiency diseases, protein deficiency. So, that, that may be a simple list of uh, uh, malnourishments you are writing your focus more has to be on the second part, different protein calorie malnutrition deficiencies. So, basically you are trying to write there about uh, the specific conditions such as you know marasmus, crush yarker kind of things. Uh, listing is one, but uh, I do not want people to simply list out the things, because we have, uh, we have set examples like you know. Uh, when we mention um, uh, a transformation from hunting gathering societies to agrarian societies. So, meaning that if at all any specific tribal communities are shifted from non peasantization, non peasant economic subsistence, they undergo the process of peasantization this peasantization could be through limited shifting cultivation or intensive agriculture and there they become the labor force or it may be plantation agriculture. For each of them, you may give the examples and talk about uh, the deficiencies. And uh, when you are giving the examples, you must make a point. One global example could be there, such as you know the Kung tribes, 
the Yonomamis. One Indian tribal example could be there. The examples such as the Chenchu or Andaman Islanders. And uh, you can also talk about global mainstream populations. Global mainstream populations. That is where you may talk about Samoans, the obesity and diabetes among Samoans. You may talk about you know, changing food taboos, changing food taboos and exposure of global foods. Disappearance of uh, local traditions in terms of food. These giving rise to new health and illness conditions. I think that can make your answer. So do not simply go in for listing the disorders, but then we will have to talk about the specific tribal mainstream communities that have become part of the victims. This is one. Coming to the other question, what is homogenization process? And what are the trends in human evolution with the help of suitable examiner? Okay. So you, we will begin with uh, the definition here. So it may be like uh, a five to seven and a half for the first part and remaining for the second part. So we are starting with the term hominization process. You may perhaps give the normal encyclopedia definition or uh, Oxford de uh, definition in anthropology dictionary. That is, it is a combination of a physical and uh, cultural evolution process in the emergence of the human. So, hominization is nothing but emergence of human by evolving both you know, in the physical and cultural aspects. When you are mentioning that, make it pretty much clear, like how Butner John says, uh, these two aspects, the physical and cultural evolution, they cannot be, they cannot be totally kept away from one another. They are, uh, they constantly influence each other and uh, one uh, determines the other. So, physical evolution, biological evolution uh, determines the capability of man on the cultural side and cultural evolution strengthens the biological evolution. So, it is from those lines. And second uh, part of your question is major trends in the human evolution. Okay. <coughs> major trends in human evolution. So, when we talk about trends, one is bipedalism and erect posture. Bipedalism and erect posture. You may say that this forms the central theme of the entire human evolution process and hence you may categorize the evolutionary processes involved, cranial features and postcranial features. In cranial, facial, mandibular, dental, and uh, upper cranial characteristics including the forehead 
emergence of cranial capacity kind of things. This is one. In the post cranial, you have changing structure of clavicle, anatomy of neck with uh, location of epiglottis. You may speak about hand skeleton, emergence of lumbar curve, and thoracic bones. lower limbs, emergence of femur <coughs> and other long bones, <coughs> toe structure, ankle and knee structure, foot arches, all that forms part of and then the requirement of giving pictures every place. So, all that makes this is coterminous width. This is coterminous width emergence of culture because tool making goes hand in hand with the prehensile thumb and articulative brain. This is number one. Tool making is also associated with the dietary habits And all this once again links to social system. So, basically, wherever possible, the examiner looks for having certain pictures, so that you are trying to interconnect different uh, aspects of your content, because this huge amount of content that has to come into these answers. If you go on trying to write in simply long statements you will not be able to do and hence pictorial representations become important. And then we have uh, the other question. This is one other uh, beautiful question. How did Clifford Geeds look at religion and differentiate between anthropological and psychological approaches to the study of religion? So, when you talk about this psychological approach, it is like uh, Malinowski's approach towards religion. So, that is psychological functional study of religion. And, uh, when we talk about uh, anthropological approach as such according to Geeds, we are trying to look at the symbolic approach. So, basically the questions call for interpretation and they call for redefining the question, so that you are going close to what has to be written. And also you see when we talk about Clifford Geeds, many people remember uh, remember cockfights and symbolism alone, but then religion was also one of the major things that he had written about. His initial writings uh, of uh, uh, you know symbolism might not have uh, incorporated a lot of uh, uh, writings on, on, on religion, but then in his later writings we see that uh, he was uh, writing on articles like you know. Uh, <coughs> 
approaches to study religion and uh, uh, no, the concept of religious studies in anthropology kind of thing. So, you may perhaps begin with that. That is, uh, the later writings of Clifford Gates focused on religion, combining the idea of symbolism as well as uh, the thick description studies. Having said that, <coughs> let us have a look at it. How did he look at religion? Gids and religion. So, you may begin with his later interest. You may give the name of the article and book talking about religion. When he studied religion, in combination symbolic interpretative and uh, also religion from the thick description mechanism. And that is where he seemed to be different from the conventional Malinowski's way or conventional evolutionary style. This you may perhaps mention. And uh, your answer would be largely based on the field work that he had done in Indonesia. In Indonesia, you may perhaps list the small islands where he provided a comparative study of Christianity, Islam and Hinduism. Parallelly, he was also trying to incorporate tribal religion, but more emphasis was on the mainstream religions. When he was trying to talk about this, he was trying to look at interconnections between them, interconnections between them plus interpretations. Interconnections because they were trying to cohabit. So, what are the factors that were trying to bring in? strengthening of relationship between them, strengthening of relationship between them. When he is talking about strengthening of relationship, that is where he incorporated study of rituals. How rituals have a uh, <coughs> mechanism of bringing them together. Interpretation, <coughs> so three things he spoke about. One is uh, the interpretation by themselves. Suppose he is talking about Christianity interpretation by themselves. Second one is his own ethic orientation, interpretation. And third one is how other religions have interpreted um, the respective religion in question. So, if at all he was studying Christianity, how Christianity was looked at by the either Islamic or Hindu populations. That was uh, the content of his study. And when we talk about uh, comparison, anthropological versus psychological, that is where we see psychological functionalism of Malinowski for religion versus this. So, all this is actually describing his own work. And then you may perhaps go in for the psychological functionalism. This is one way of writing. The other way could be going chronologically. First, you may talk about what was the major interest of uh, Gates in religion? Conventionally, what is psychological anthropology? So, you know, you may perhaps uh, discuss about um, bringing people together or the kind of explaining the unexplainable things and then trying to fight the fear and blah, blah, blah kind of psychological elements there. And then you may perhaps come to 
uh, Geeds describing his own field work and how exactly he was trying to apply the field anthropological knowledge, research methodologies in explaining <coughs> the interpretation. So, I think that that format would do good. You are finishing off with the psychological anthropology, how religion had looked at it and then you are switching over to Geed's way of doing things, because Geed's comes much later, applications wise also he is much more elaborate. So, you may perhaps incorporate there that uh, Geed's interpretation is not simply talking about functionalism, but then much more than that, how people can come together, how people can preserve their culture, what is the thick description that is involved, what are the risks involved of the people when they are trying to live together, what are the compromises and things like that. I think that can give a much more beautiful framework in writing. And then, uh, you have the other question here, that is mixed longitudinal studies of uh, longitudinal methods of studying human growth. So, basically, when we are talking about uh, uh, <coughs> mixed longitudinal studies, there are two things that uh, I was trying to get into. One is the cross-sectional studies, the second one is longitudinal studies and then both of them put together. So, uh, here what we look at it is. cross-sectional studies and longitudinal studies. This is one about a single population. Secondly, a comparison cross-cultural and uh, within a specific culture group. When we say this, we are actually referring to <coughs> synchronic and diachronic studies. So, your answer has to be a combination of these two. When we talk about cross-sectional studies, we are trying to mention um, measurements such as cranial measurements or uh, you know circumference studies, circumference studies such as you know hand circumferences or wrist circumference studies or study of waist etcetera. I mean, this is one. And then longitudinally, we are talking about height attainment uh, and uh, length of bones kind of. So, basically, we are trying to look at different anthropometric measurements. So, the question is about anthropometry come and bringing it into human growth studies. There are certain anthropometric studies at the, that are measuring the cross-sectional uh, growth that may be cranial studies, circumferences at different uh, places in the, in the morphology and then longitudinal studies basically about height attainment and how the length of bones, length of thoracic region has been growing. So, these are all uh, Dif we, we are trying to bring in different mechanisms of measurement and then perhaps the second one is a comparative study of the same population at same individuals at different points of time. So, that is where we are trying to bring in the growth tables for each population cross culturally. I mean that is where uh, anthropological studies became much more popular like you know Japanese and American or mainstream and tribal or plains and hill populations, etcetera. And at each one of them, you may perhaps uh, talk about merits and demerits. Merits in the sense that um, 
see um, basically the whole thing is to establish growth patterns of, uh, of children so that you have healthy population. So, these are monitoring mechanisms to see to it that a population with you know, proper health conditions. So, anthropometry brings us an explanation about the healthy or otherwise population. So, growth patterns can be monitored. On the other hand, it becomes an expensive thing, expensive in the sense that you need to have manpower, you need to have data to be generated and data to be monitored and analyzed. It is not simply that you should be having tools of measurement and also you are supposed to deal with all the different kinds of prejudices people might be happening in revealing their you know, bodily statistics and kind of, so that, that, that is how things are. But then technically, when you are talking about uh, cross-sectional and longitudinal measurement, I insist that you go with the, uh, with the tools, like you know, what are the kinds of uh, bar scales that are used, horizontal scales, calipers that are used. So, kind of anthropometric tools become significant. <coughs> so, basically you may perhaps refer to uh, you know, writings such as manuals related to anthropometry uh, that can help you out. So, that is <coughs> 3 C. Coming to the, the question, the role of marriage regulations in traditional societies in India. Traditional in the sense that can be tribal or mainstream traditional society. The key word here is how the marriage regulations can strengthen social solidarity. So, <coughs> we may perhaps use Paul Bohannon or writers like Lucy Meyer who spoke of these things or you may also give reference of Haviland. Now, what are the different types of marriage regulations? So, you define this term then you give the typologies. One regulation is endogamy versus exogamy. The other regulation could be incest taboo. Third is prescriptive proscriptive and preferential rules out of these proscriptive can be incest preferential may be different kinds of cousin marriages, marriages like uncle niece marriages, prescriptive can be endogamy, exogamy. So, you may perhaps use this or you can give these kinds of. We are talking about India and how social solidarity. So, make it a point that all examples you should give from India alone. <coughs> Do not try to you now go in for a 
fem minuter så här med rygg. Liksom. After fourth question, we'll try to take a break. <coughs> so basically, when we are talking about social solidarity, and you can go in for further detailing, like you know, caste endogamy, religion endogamy, region endogamy. I mean, that is where from you are bringing the idea of social solidarity. Exogamy is like you know, when we are talking about exogamy, we are trying to marry outside. But then that is where we are trying to get a solidarity from outside our own, you know, uh, social group. And then even when we are talking about incest related ones, we are trying to establish marital links with people outside your own in group. So that is where bringing together of people is happening. So it is not simply trying to talk about the examples, but at what levels the strengthening of we-ness is coming in the society. That you should not forget. No? <coughs> coming to the other question, various methods of personal identification based on skeletal remains. Personal identification, yeah. So basically you would be mentioning here that this is a field of study, content of study in forensic anthropology. Methods of personal identification based on skeletal remains. So, they may be facial study. So, basically we are trying to use osteology. See, uh, if he is not mentioning this skeletal remains, if he simply says personal identification, huge lot of things come into existence in your answer. Apart from this, you have dental studies, you have blood group studies and you also have dermatoglyphics. So, this is for the comprehensive question, but in this question he is not asking all this, he is very much specific that it is a question on skeletal. So, facial bones, facial osteology, then skull related or and then you have post cranial aspects of personal identification. So, when we say personal identification, using these, you are trying to establish the gender of the individual, the ethnic identity of the individual, <coughs> and then perhaps you are using these either to confirm the missing persons or you are trying to establish the identity of the criminal or maybe perhaps you are trying to establish the victim's identification. So, your answer is actually talking about which are the tools and where is the purpose. So, gender, ethnic identity, age of the individual that is affected. And uh, also you are trying to establish the facts such as, if at all you are mentioning death of the individual, the study should actually confirm finally the reasons for death. But most of the time your answer lies here. And hence, let me take the answer further. Most of the discussion of your answer lies in skeleton and uh, how exactly you are able to confirm the age of the individual. So, uh, from the bone studies you are able to uh, confirm whether that is an infant or a child or an adult. So, that is where if at all you are speaking about the skull bones, 
based on the fusing of the skull plates, you will come to a conclusion whether that is the individual is less than you know 12 years, less than 25 years or it is the person about 25 years, that is one. When we talk about gender, we are especially looking at uh, the, the texture of uh, the, the facial bones and the shape of the skull and also most importantly, the kind of uh, pelvic structure that gives the identification of the gender. When we talk about ethnic identity, so we generally see um, the hill populations and others, how the structure of uh, the skeleton is when compared to limb structure and thoracic structure. This is number one. Second could be, you know, ethnic identity like negroid, caphazoid, mangaloid, etc. So, here in this particular question, there are some kind of pictures that become mandatory for you. Those pictures, one is the pelvic structure number one. Second one is three different kind of skulls become mandatory for you in order to indicate the cacozoids, mangaloids and then negroid. So, small pictures can be in pelvic basically you are trying to establish the gender identification. <coughs> I think uh, that can give you a decent uh, uh, kind of an answer. So, back home when you are preparing, those of you who have not written exam this year, next year you are trying to write, you try to prepare an answer with a 20 marker in mind. So, what are the different methods of personal identification? You do not stick to skeletal remains alone, all four if uh, you will have to write in the same answer how exactly you would structure, I think. Uh, so, one is in forensic anthropology, forensic osteology, basically the question is about forensic osteology. What are the tools? Study of facial bones, skull bones, post uh, cranial bones and then what is the re, what is the target group that is age, gender and ethnic identity. Basically, what is it that you are trying to establish missing persons in accidents or natural calamities and then who is the criminal, what is the, you no, know, who is the victim kind of, so that is how things are. The other question is major mesolithic sites and uh, describe typo technological features with special reference to India. So, Indian Mesolithic basically, this is actually a huge question. You can be asked for 15 marks or you can be asked for 20 marks. <coughs> so, basically when we were uh, doing in the class etcetera in the recent batch, we were speaking of different researches that were associated with Mesolithic site discovery. So, in the description of uh, the sites, those thinkers become mandatory for you. you know? And then perhaps uh, I may share these names, etcetera, for a general benefit, which were the earlier uh, Mesolithic sites. So, basically, he is talking about identify major Mesolithic sites, describe the typo technological features. So, at each of the site, each of the regions, what were the tools that you were finding, whether these are the earlier sites or the later sites and what is it that you were actually trying to study in the typo technological aspects. So, what type of tools were found at each of the sites and what are the um, tool technology. So, basically you can perhaps, you know, this picture gives you the regional specificity, Langanaj, Bhimbetka, Adamgarh, these are the uh, traditional sites that we generally do. You may perhaps use these uh, sites and then at each site what exactly you are finding, this may be one beautiful way of connecting the links. So, we take a break for 10 minutes, we will reassemble for the rest of the questions. And those of you who are watching online, you can take a break for 10 minutes, come back to see.
Thank you very much for the messages from the students who were writing the exam. People were pretty much happy, contented with the, what we had done in the classes. <coughs> Let us look at some of uh, the other things. These are all direct questions, sir. Polygenic inheritance. This was one. Very recently, also, we were discussing about this prehistoric significance of a uh, Rakhi Gari. <coughs> so, that is where uh, we see a complete overhauling of Indian archaeology. And uh, even in the Anthro Run program, we were talking about this particular question. So, directly, we were uh, giving the significance in terms of how uh, India all of a sudden emerges into the scale of Harappan civilization. <coughs> so, perhaps uh, uh, in this question, you will have to incorporate what are all the important things on burial practices and uh, what were all the different socio-economic conditions that were studied, religious aspects, economy and most importantly, the genomic studies that have happened. So, basically, this had revolutionized the whole thing about India's understanding of Indian, of, uh, you know, Indian archaeology. <coughs> so, how city planning, material culture was there. That is very beautiful setting of about 2000 years ago. Something that must have come as a surprise to students is uh, glottochronology. So, let me say this again, except for those two, three questions, all the rest of the ones you are in a position to attempt. So, I mean, students can pretty well, uh, you know, score with, uh, you know, two questions being attempted from section one. So, basically, this is a combination of uh, historical linguistics and uh, <coughs> also e uh, etiology, as we say, etiology, study of words. Historical linguistics is how language has evolved. And uh, glottochronology is also something like, you know, cross-cultural uh, impact of uh, on language. See, those of you who have uh, studied social context of language use, and uh, how the emergence of uh, short term languages mm -hmm. and uh, ad hoc languages must have emerged in Africa, parts of Indonesia, etcetera. That is where glottochronology comes into existence. So, basically, it is where we study what is the percentage of uh, words that are disappearing, new percentage of words that are emerging, how is it that uh, other languages are impacting our own language kind of studies. <coughs> so, that is where we use other things also like lexico statistics we call it. Menopausal symptoms is also a very direct question. Always see to it that uh, you write the reasons for study. We are studying menopausal uh, symptoms in anthropology because of changing demography and uh, increasing the lifespan of women. Women more than 50 years of age you now increasing in percentage and that is where uh, we study. Your answer has to be categorized uh, into different phases. In each of the phase, what are the symptoms that you study? Starting from uh, premenopause to perimenopause, menopause and postmenopausal times, how exactly the female, what kind of uh, you know, symptoms they are expressing. So, this picture alone can give you uh, the required uh, information. But then you see, uh, when it comes to uh, specific anthropological studies, I want you to um, give uh, uh, the popular studies of uh, D. N. Majumdar or contemporary studies like uh, uh, Andhra University, what they have put across and various other studies, which I have incorporated in your physical anthropology book, good number of them <coughs> and vital questions that we generally study in anthropology. Why is it that, uh, I mean, these are the reasons why menopausal studies became very important because of the psychological factors involved, demographic factors involved, etc. And uh, spelling error here, I am sorry. 
cultural lag. This is one uh, kind of a topic that becomes essential in studying cultural differences in evolution. When certain cultures, see, when you were uh, studying topics like uh, uh, you know, evolution, where some cultures seem to have evolved faster, some were not really uh, going with that kind of a speed, etc. These questions uh, must have uh, come as, as a discussion. So basically, when uh, Ogburn was explaining, see what might happen is you might not be knowing Ogburn, some of you, and uh, you might have come across this term cultural lag. So even if you did not know uh, the, you know, <coughs> what exactly William Ogburn was talking about in cultural lag, that you need not worry about. Simply about cultural lag also one can write, meaning what are the reasons for certain cultures must have evolved faster and certain cultures could not evolve faster. So, the reasons could be technological reasons or maybe perhaps sociological reasons are there. Um, politically, you know, how uh, the protectionism had encouraged people to evolve faster. So, when you are trying to talk on those lines, you can perhaps use, uh, use references from say in Iron Age cultures, how is it that certain cultures evolved faster or uh, technologically why is it that Western Europe had uh, emerged as a major thing at one point of time and uh, how the Eastern societies like the Chinese or Indian uh, or uh, maybe perhaps uh, uh, Burmese kind of cultures, they suddenly take a, take a back seat. These are the kind of examples that you may, but in fact uh, Ogburn was also dealing with uh, such kind of references only. <coughs> so, that is uh, the one and uh, the other questions that you have, these were uh, the pretty uh, direct kind of uh, content that comes. Controversies related to the field work of Bronislaw Manilowski and Margaret Mead. The basic term is controversies. See, uh, we see that both of them were primary source uh, data studies. Malinowski was, uh, was more relying on a meek, so he was like <coughs> realistic ethnograph. Mead was also more or less realistic ethnographer. She was taking from the field whatever data was given to her unquestioningly. Uh, so that is where you see parallels. So, your answer must talk about largely in the introductory paragraph, you may talk about, see both of them were looking at pure realistic and ME kind of a data with further detailing being different. On the one hand, uh, she was depending on a limited sample and Malinowski was depending on informers, but both of them have got their own strengths and weaknesses and it is from that point of view, what are the dangers that are involved in realistic ethnograph, that is one. And second thing is when it comes to meet the kind of experimental ethnography that she was doing, um, how is it, how is, how was it difficult to settle with the, with the sample and interpretation of data from the sample that became a major um, her, you know, thing for her. And uh, the other major problem that we see is there was no restudy method. Restudy was conducted in those regions by different other people which brought out different kind of uh, you know, uh, information from there. So basically, what are the problems associated with the technique? If at all participant observation was something that was used by Malinowski, um, what are the dangers involved? And in the case of Margaret Mead, what are the dangers involved in the sampling methods? And uh, visual anthropology, if she was using, how visual anthropology cannot be a total substitute from uh, the other thing. So, I, these are the ways in which you should be going, but of course, while you are concluding, you will have to talk high about, you know, whenever they are doing for the first time such kind of experimentation in a social science that definitely would have some kind of a flaws, but everything said and done, both of them seem to have, you know, established anthropology in a very high pedestal. <coughs> then we have uh, the other questions, 
impact of globalization on economic systems of indigenous. So, basically two questions are there with the same theme. Like Anadure's question is also about globalization and how globalization impacted the simple societies. Separately also this question is given globalization and uh, indigenous economic systems. Pretty direct question, many times it was asked. So, basically you are looking at uh, how globalization has impacted the hunter gatherers, pastoralists or uh, shifting cultivators, fishing communities. So, prior to intensive agriculture, whatever economic subsistences are there, how those people were affected with globalization. Uh, in each of the categories you had done the examples in the class like how in the in the contemporary times of uh, uh, globalization because of contact with I mean basically all those studies as you could recall they are from uh, MNCs and how globalization was impacting uh, like you know Yanamamis are there because of MNCs associated with gold trade they are having certain impacts. So, when you are giving all these three, four different varieties, there are certain common problems that are emerging like that may be ethnocide, that may be genocide, health related concerns are there, loss of economic subsistence is there. So, there are certain common causes, you enlist the common causes, give those examples and then specifically what are the problems. Say for example, Sudanese tribes are there that were actually pastoral tribes, now they are not into pastoralism, they are into they are into trade of weapons or they are working as soldiers in the guerrilla warfare kind of so very contemporary kind of a thing whatever examples that you have learnt in the class that is more than sufficient to write the answer from there. And uh, practical applications of uh, DNA technologies in the current scenario. So, this we try to uh, analyze in what we call uh, anthropogenetics, anthropogenetics. And this is also pretty much direct kind of a question, those of you who are reading from physical anthropology book written by me, I mean you can directly see the 10, 11 applications that I have incorporated. So basically, hmm, you have one that is eugenic applications, eugenic applications, where we see <coughs> the correction of diseases, one may be correction, the second one is dealing with inheritance. So, disease conditions is one. Second thing is improving desirable characteristics, improving desirable characteristics, practically speaking disease resistance. Some people also try to look at having higher IQ levels, higher or better adaptation capabilities. <coughs> DNA technologies now is also used in the prediction of occurrence of diseases, prediction of diseases. There is other set, one is criminology, criminology where DNA studies <coughs> can identify the culprit, all that you have uh, done in the first uh, session where we were speaking about personal identification etcetera. So, in criminology, in identification of missing people etcetera. And we also have uh, such kind of applications in uh, what we call uh, genocide related cases, genocide cases <coughs> where uh, family members are actually helped in giving the bodies of their missing people, etc. This is one, I mean when the question looks to be see practical applications of DNA technology in the in current scenario, he does not specifically mention human, but then if it is a question in general studies you would write about the whole lot of things like you know agricultural uh, utilities and then industrial applications and all that. 
But here when we talk about within anthropology, though he is not mentioning specifically, we try to restrict ourselves to the uh, human resource, human researchers in uh, DNA technology. And that is where we can also talk about things like cloning. artificial insemination. So, basically when I am talking about this, I am giving those categories of uh, eugenics, like you know positive eugenics and negative eugenics, where uh, you are trying to use the DNA technologies in, <coughs> in conducting research on, uh, on the to be born children, twin studies are there, amniocentesis studies you will do and identifying the, the health conditions, the growth patterns of children uh, through, through the prenatal studies, etcetera. So, basically you are trying to get a mix of things like you know DNA technology studies, you have pedigree analysis or you know foster child methods, etcetera. You are trying to use those technologies you know, or those methods and DNA technologies in order to find solution to problems. <coughs> So, all those things like you no know, triple child method or cloning, artificial insemination, these come as uh, handy for uh, answering your question. So, basically it deals with enlisting all those methods and trying to give a statement or two about each of them. You have uh, this question, I was trying to generate an answer for this, I will be sharing this answer with you soon after uh, this thing, qualitative data analysis. And of course, uh, <coughs> this is something that was uh, not uh, still becoming a regular part of uh, our uh, studies, but then uh, now that the question has come a little more exploration has to be done about it. So, I have tried to categorize the answer into what are the various methods and what are the different softwares. Because you see in the field of digital anthropology, they have started using a lot of statistical data uh, across the countries when they are doing cultural studies, demographic studies and the census, etcetera. They have started using you know whole lot of uh, software technologies. So, this particular uh, uh, you know, answer that I have generated, I will try to share with you, you can go through. And just because it is asked now, it does not mean that the same answer you try to memorize and things like that. This is once in a blue moon things happen like this, but then you will have to see what other kind of similar content can be asked in the future, that is that's, uh, more significant. And uh, yeah, assumptions that must be met for a population to be genetical, having genetic equilibrium, it is nothing but a question on Hardy-Weinberg law the five major assumptions of Hardy-Weinberg law and uh, <coughs> what are the drawbacks of Hardy-Weinberg law. The second part is talking about explain the importance of genetic equilibrium. Genetic equilibrium most of the time is a utopian situation and that is where is the major drawback of uh, Hardy-Weinberg law. But then for an ideal situation we try to use. So, this and the question is nothing but about uh, what are the assumptions of uh, that law and what are the drawbacks. Uh, the third one that you have here is uh, political and methodological aspects of national character studies. We divide that into two, <coughs> elicited the contemporary relevance of history. So, basically uh, this is a question talking about what made psychological anthropologists to conduct national character studies. So, that is the political condition, the political background under which NCS has emerged. So, that may be you know American and uh, Japanese rivalry, World War II related all those crises, where understanding the enemy population became important. So, you are trying to explain that political setting. The second thing is methodologies adopted. When we talk about methodologies adopted, we have these two people that is Mead and Benedict what kind of uh, techniques they had used like you know <coughs> culture pattern studies are there or uh, content analysis method is there, tertiary source of data collection is there and uh, sampling methods are there. <coughs> so, all these form part of methodologies. So, I repeat one is political setting you are explaining in methodologies two major people come into picture 
one is benedict the second one is mead what different methodologies they had used to study the japanese population or any particular population say you know mead was uh, mentioning the three different uh, populations based on the gender studies etc and even benedict was mentioning uh, the special you know genius kind of a thing so those are all the methodologies and concepts they have used so that forms the major aspect of your answer five marks you can allot to the contemporary relevance of such studies contemporary relevance uh, uh, comes into picture one is establishing international relations that may be political relations diplomatic relations or defense related studies this is number one second thing is as we see in to, in today's times like how digital anthropology and other things are being used in order to understand the preferences of people so in order to produce certain commodities market certain commodities for the people it becomes essential to have the national character the national preference so basically now we see that psychological anthropology and ncs is emerging as a very important area in trade and international capturing international markets on the one hand and in order to predict the behavior in order to make the policies for the people uh, you know oh, who may be on the other side of the table that may not be your enemy but then you need to understand them betterly so that you, you understand them better so that is where such kind of studies actually become <coughs> significant <coughs> then you have 8a this is uh, arjun apadurai's conceptualization of global cultural economy so this is actually an extension of the previous question that was asked that is uh, globalization and impact on indigenous societies so that is where uh, his work is in the contemporary american indian anthropologist who worked on uh, things like cultural dimensions that are involved with uh, with the globalization uh, when we talk about him there are three or four things that you should uh, uh, mention <clears throat> one concept he spoke about is deterritorialization cultures flow and then deterritorialization of cultural aspects so what are the tools that are involved in in restrict in in not restricting little tradition to itself but little traditions emerging as great traditions across the globe so deterritorialization the second thing majorly he spoke spoke about is the concept called scape when you mention scape that may be a variation that might happen uh, like you know um, suppose we say ethnoscape ethnoscape is nothing but people moving from place to place technoscape maybe technology moving from place to place so what is he trying to say deterritorialization of cultural aspects second one is scapes or movements people moving technology moving goods moving or ecosystems moving so ecosystems travel in the sense that sometimes deserts spread sometimes you know uh, water bodies as they are expanding the water body spread because of their their movement the cultures change so he was trying to explain the geographical determinants and then third thing that he brings in in the global cultural economy is how commodification is happening cultural commodification see elsewhere uh, we were discussing uh, about uh, tribal art and commodification today's times whatever small marketable entity is there that is getting commodified and commercialized and in that process we may not be giving the due credit to the tribal who must have invented that thing who must have used it for several generation that's where he says commodification and loss of rights of the natives on particular technologies this is one he talks about and an extension of that what he says is because of such commodification rights of people are being lost there has to be international national agencies that should take care of the interests of the uh, little traditions and it is on those lines next year when you will be writing your exam you will have to prepare on something like intellectual property rights and how exactly anthropology plays a role in the protection of intellectual property rights <coughs> so that is where uh, and finally he was talking about the emergence of cultural homogeneity which is 
which is against anthropological norms. Anthropology always looked at having a recognition of all the smaller traditions and cultures. On the one hand, we see that uh, they seem to be uh, losing their identity. There is a monoculture emerging. Homogenization of culture is happening. That is where anthropology has to play a major role. That is what he was trying to talk about. So, one should be watchful about what are the thinkers you should be studying for the upcoming year. Um, the causes of structural abnormalities. So, this question we had uh, written, we had another question of this kind. That is, in the very first question, the very first question, we had gene expression. Gene expression, wherein we spoke about certain causes of structural abnormalities. <coughs> so, you may talk about uh, chromosomal karyotyping method, that is where structural and other kinds of abnormalities are studied <coughs> in order to identify the reasons whatsoever. And then you may perhaps give a small table incorporating what are the different structural abnormalities that may be, you know, we were mentioning deletion, duplication, translocation, etcetera. For each of them, you can give the <coughs> example there. After that, you try to give the causes. Causes may be inheritance, causes may be maternal age of uh, the women, and then uh, it may be uh, problems in the cell division it may be radiation effects, mutation effects, so kind of things. So, basically he is right, he is asking about the causes for structural abnormalities. Then what you should be doing is, uh, certain causes may be common to all these structural abnormalities. Say for example, higher maternal age may be a common thing, but then in certain cases there is no correlation between higher maternal age and the others. And also here you may talk about is there any racial equation, any particular ethnic group. Say for example, uh, you know cacozoids uh, have got uh, higher incidence of uh, Down syndrome when compared to the negroids. If any such kind of um, conclusions are drawn, those have to be made part of. So, causes that are common to several people and causes several abnormalities and causes that are specific to to them. This, this distinction has to be brought in and um, perhaps uh, you may talk about uh, uh, how genetic engineering and DNA studies is now for in a way helping people to prepare their own uh, <coughs> you know gene pool pictures, their individual wise you know DNA profiling people are able to do. By doing profiling you will be in a position to identify whether there is a possibility of inheriting uh, any kind of chromosomal abnormalities. So, you try to conclude on the utility of uh, these methods. And then you have uh, Krober, this is one other uh, significant uh, uh, study, that is Krober's study of uh, kinship. So, basically speaking, uh, we mention him as uh, American anthropologist, mostly associated with diffusionary studies, but then he was also somebody who was associated with uh, kinship studies, <coughs> like uh, the way you must have uh, gone to Morgan's study, this man also going in a Morgan's tradition. That one has to see, Krober followed the Morgan's tradition in studying uh, kinship system. So, he tried to classify them on the lines of what uh, Morgan had done, like you know classificatory and descriptive methods. What is the basis of uh, any particular population following classificatory and descriptive methods. And then he was talking about different varieties of unilineal descent groups. What decides the unilineal descent group, whether it is matrilineal, patrilineal descent group, etcetera. And the third thing he was talking about was how anthropologists should make it a practice to draw the kinship charts as uh, we uh, keep asking the students to make their own 
family charts, distant charts, etc. So he was trying to talk on those genealogy maps and then kinship maps so that anthropological knowledge can help people to know how kinship's importance is changing. So, and then he was also talking about how um, kinship was experiencing an evolution. So basically, the, the three, four things, I repeat what I said, one is classifying kinship, kinship systems. And second thing is <coughs> drawing of a kinship terminology pictures, genealogy pictures, reasons for why people preferred unilinear descent groups and uh, what are the diverse kinds of unilineal descent groups. He was also looking into how kinship evolved in two ways. One is how kinship evolved in anthropological studies and how in general across the societies kinship's importance changed or increased, etc. So that is where you know Krober's uh, contribution seems to be much more workable. But then, yeah, uh, similar to Morgan, he also seemed to have made certain mistakes that critical appraisal is also necessary, whether classical, classificatory system comes first or descriptive comes first kind of things. And uh, he was also trying to link kinship studies with his own culture area school. But then perhaps uh, you may write in somewhere in your conclusion that more than his culture area, school kinship studies seem to have had a lot of functional uh, you know, utility and kind of. So this particular part you see that a lot of uh, you know, direct questions are there and uh, yeah, that is how things are. Two or three so papers are there which I will be circulating to you, whoever uh, were watching. And tomorrow, most probably, we will be having a paper two related uh, discussion, time, etc. We will let you know, most probably, by 8 or 8.30 in the morning, it should start uh, for about two hours or so, so you can perhaps come and attend. Have a good time. Thanks for your patience and, and that's it. Good day.